on the Real Mission Impossible show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Real Mission Impossible show. I'm Coach MJ, your host. Today, we're joined by Dr. Janelle McCauley for the show. Not only is she a fellow TEDx speaker, but she's also done a little bit of military work. You'll see what and how and what she's done since then. She holds her doctorate, and she's actually studied and focused on what causes stress in our lives. A perfect topic for tonight. I saw your TEDx. Uh, very impressive. Uh, you're a mover and a shaker. Very dynamic uh, individual. And it's an honor to meet you. Now, when you were a little girl, did you have any aspirations of uh, flying fighter jets into combat? I grew up in a family of public servants, and my grandfathers and uncle were Marines. So I was uh, in Southern California around the Marine bases a lot, and we would always see the aviation and, and air, airplanes flying around. My uncle flew helicopters and take me to the air shows. But my dad, who was a police officer, would tell anyone that would listen, you know, that I was going to grow up to be a combat. For example, if you were to make some recommendations, because there's a lot of chaos out there right now. There's a lot of stress, financial stress, emotional stress, family stress, unsurety. Is there anything you could maybe suggest? Is there some meditation or some place to start where they can really start to maybe use some some self healing tools yes for sure start thinking about this idea and I learned this as um, I worked with special operators before I left the Air Force and they have a motto that slow is smooth smooth is fast hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the real mission I'm possible show I'm Coach MJ, your host. Today we're joined by Dr. Janelle McCauley. You're gonna find out why we've invited her onto the show. Not only is she a fellow TEDx speaker, but she's also done a little bit of military work. You'll see what and how and what she's done since then. She holds her doctorate and she's actually studied and focused on what causes stress in our lives. A perfect topic for tonight. I'd like to welcome Dr. Janelle McCauley. Thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you so much for having me, Coach MJ. I'm excited to be on your podcast. This oh, I'm, I'm really, really excited. I, mean, I saw your TEDx. Uh, very impressive. Uh, you're a mover and a shaker. Very dynamic uh, individual. And it's an honor to meet you. I'd like to uh, start by saying that when you were a little girl, did you have any aspirations of uh, flying fighter jets into combat? You know, it's um, an interesting story. I grew up in a family of public servants, and my grandfathers and uncle were Marines. So I was uh, in Southern California around the Marine bases a lot, and we would always see the aviation and, and air airplanes flying around. My uncle flew helicopters and take me to the air shows. And uh, that combined with the fact that my dad, who was a police officer, would tell anyone that would listen, you know, that I was going to grow up to be a combat pilot or a submarine warfare commander you know so those like those thoughts and that messaging was kind of just put into my head at a very young age and you know I never really thought that I couldn't do any of those things which was kind of unique and different especially being a you know a, a young woman in the 80s when we couldn't you know women weren't doing those kinds of things I distinctly even remember you know watching Top Gun at the time and looking at my dad and saying dad how come the girls didn't get to fly the planes? Um, and so that just started some interesting conversations in our house about like what I could do, what was possible for me in the future. And, you know, it was one of those uh, just journeys where I don't know that it was like, I knew from a very young age that that was what I was going to do. I knew that the potential existed and then kind of the path just lit up for me in that direction. So going through high school, I mean, was it in your mind, your, your, freshman or, or sophomore in high school, were you thinking just a couple more years and I'm going to get it, get into university and get into the, get into the military. Was that it? No, I mean, I, you know, to be, to be perfectly honest, I actually had this dream of being a dancer on Broadway. I know like such, such different, right? Like, but that was kind of the person I was. I, 
never really fell into one category. And I think that that's a great example for young people today that, you know, you can grow up and have different experiences and passions about things, but that doesn't necessarily have to define, you know, like a stereotype of where you're going to go in the future. And so um, it was one of those things. I think my, my parents looked at me and said, okay, if that's really what you want to do, like you got to go to college first and get a real job. So, you know, and, and then if that's really your dream, you could, you could do that later. And as I looked into colleges and I looked into kind of career fields, um, you know, the Air Force Academy was one of the ones I looked at. And as I, and then the Naval Academy at that, I applied to both. And as I kind of just looked more into the life that I could build for myself by going to one of those institutions, I kind of felt like, you know, this could be something very interesting. That, and then the competitive, my competitive nature, my dad just had to tell a couple of my guy friends, you know, back in high school that there was even a potential that I was going to go to an academy. And I think they're, you know, the looks on their faces when they're like, no way, I don't know that Janelle could do that. Um, also kind of, I think, helped light a fire for me, you know, like, why not me? Um, and then once I was there, I just made like the best friends and had just such a unique experience. I remember coming home from college in the summer and I got to talk about how I was jumping out of airplanes and learning how to fly airplanes and doing some unique things and, you know, combat simulations and. Sure. Sure. I mean, your, your typical uh, collegiate studies as you were. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, it, you know, and it just kind of clicked with me, right? Like it, it was a good fit. Right. So tell me this then, was it, did you encounter, I have to ask, of course, uh, did you encounter it was a man's world? Definitely. Definitely. Okay. When I went to the Air Force Academy, I think there was about 18% female, like with the um, initial uh kind of like the, the, those that got into the academy. But by the time we graduated, my graduating class had like around 10% female. So we're, we were definitely a minority. It was definitely challenging. It was, um, I would not say easy, um, but I kind of thrive in stressful as well. We could probably talk about just my life in general. I kind of thrive in, in stressful environments. And so I was kind of built for it. Um, but it was not the easy path, that is for sure. And were you... Were you jeered? I have to ask this. Excuse me again. Were you jeered? Were you intimidated? You know, my daughter is thinking about perhaps going in that path, maybe not as high, but certainly one of those paths. Can she expect to be intimidated and bullied uh, by the boys club? Um, I don't know if I would use those words like jeered, bullied, that kind of thing. Um, I think there was just an expectation and, the, the, the issue that I think really happens with a lot of women in male dominated career fields is that two things. One is women aren't allowed to just be average, right? Like when, when you're um, a minority in that way, it's like the expectation is that you're either going to kick ass and be like the number one, you know, uh, person in your class or your training program or whatever, or you're going to be at the bottom. Like there's not like you can't kind of skate through. Um, and so I know for me, I always just, wanted to be at the top of the class, right? Like do everything that I could to like put in the effort, do the hard work so that there wasn't anything to talk about, right? Like there weren't any type of like, oh, should she be here? It was definitely based on my merit. But the one thing I also think we, we struggle with is um, the uniqueness of being an only female in environments can also, I think, create um, a specialness, right? That we feel that then I think hinders the ability for more women to grow with us. And I've seen that in a lot of my, my peers and the women that led above me, like some challenges associated with that. Like, can, can there be more enough room for women? And I'd like to think we're growing and we're changing, especially in the military environments. There are, you know, programs, there are discussions we're having now. Like there used to be this idea of, well, just don't talk about your gender, you know, just meet the same metrics and um, like uh, get the results, right? And it doesn't matter what your gender is. But the fact of the matter is, is when I'm sitting there at the table as the only woman, like it's evident, right? Like it's not like you just blend in. And so I think it's about applauding our uniqueness, like celebrating our diversity, but then also keeping a certain standard that we all need to meet to, to execute our, you know, um, military mission. And in your military mission, uh, could you describe for our listening audience tonight what your military path was? 
Yeah, so I flew um, mobility aircraft. I flew C-21 Learjets, and then I flew C-130 Combat Tactical Airlifters, and I also flew KC-10 Air Refuelers. Um, upgraded and where it was an instructor in all three different we call major weapon systems and so a lot of training happened in the early part of my career as I moved from plane to plane uh, following that I was able to lead teams I commanded um, a few units um, culminating in a squadron command um, that I had where I, I led a joint team which had Army Air Force Marine or um, Army Air Force Navy and uh, civilians and so we ran two different airfields and um, around the same time I had just finished my PhD research and so I kind of became known for really instituting the first human performance based uh, leadership initiatives uh, as a military leader. And so we practiced mindfulness, we built a human performance center, we just did things a little differently in our unit and um, you know it was not as celebrated and rewarded in the moment but looking back right everyone can kind of see now we collected some some data we won a bunch of awards like the benefits that came for kind of focusing on your people in a different way so in the in the in the civilian world we we know that leadership is a different whole set of values and practices simply because we believe that looking at the military and military is an authoritative uh, rank and file leadership. So if you're commanding a group or a platoon or a squadron or a battalion, they have to do what you order them to do because that's their job. And it's yes, sir, no man, no man, three bags full. Exactly. When, it, when you come out though, there's this new thing, you know, the last 25 years, which, you know, our moms all knew about, it's called emotional intelligence. And, you know, when you combine that with leadership, and then your secret weapon, mindfulness, going back 7,000 years to Sanskrit and Indian wisdom and all that, combining that to be here now, that's an amazing transformation in the military. Absolutely. It was definitely met with a lot of skepticism, I'm not going to lie. Um, I was called bold or unconventional in my leadership style. Oh, you um, already a trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, you know, and the interesting thing, MJ, and you might be, be able to appreciate this is, as well, um, when you think about leadership, you're right. In the military, it is all about, like, I have a rank on my shoulder and you have to listen to me because of the positional authority I've been given. However, as we both know, right, trust is really what leadership is about, right? And it's not just about creating followers. It's creating leaders underneath you, right? Like building more leaders. And I think we, we say the right rhetoric around that in the military, but really we do have this hierarchical and organizational structure um, that's more conducive to that authoritative leadership. And so what I think I was trying to do is take it in the sense of it's more about being an organic leader. Like how can I build the trust that I need to be innovative, to have creative visions, to think strategically? Because I think most of the time in the military when you're you know, just dealing with the day to day, you end up like just hitting five meter targets all day, right? Like what's the crisis of the day? You never get to sit back actually reflect, think strategically. And those are all the things we need to be doing as organizations. So I really started with this idea of people first and building trust. And it actually came from this quote I heard from Colin Powell. He said that um, if people trust you, um, they will follow you if only out of curiosity. And you know, a lot of people have said to me, how did you get, you know, 400 people to buy into this idea of mindfulness and talking about connection and love? That quote really sums up my experience as a military leader. I started by building trust and I started by doing it in a way that was really about deep connection. And that was new for the military, right? With that positional authority, I didn't need to know anything about the people I led. I just needed to tell them what to do and how to get the mission done. Right. And I really changed that. I wanted to know the people that I led. I wanted them to know me. I wanted to connect with them at a very human level. As you alluded to, like emotional intelligence is so vital for leadership and building trust, but it wasn't something I think that the military necessarily valued up until recently. And so when I was kind of experimenting with things like talking about, you know, care and concern, like going back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Like most of the time in the military, you're like, you got a paycheck. Right, have your you know, and food to eat. You have your physiological needs met. 
you're, you're safe in your environment. And so now we're like, be awesome, airmen. And then we're like, what's wrong with them? Why can't they be awesome? And we forget that they need care and concern and this belonging and self-esteem. And so that's really the areas I focused in on. And so when people say, how are you able to get, you know, 400 members of a military unit to go along with you on this interesting journey? I just said, I always say, I like to say I follow, or I started with trust. I started with connection. I started with presence. And then I think they followed me maybe only out of curiosity at first, but um, afterward, I think that the things I was teaching are so powerful. They were all having these micro changes within their own lives that were turning out to be transformational for them. And you were actually seeing this because you were nurturing the same group of people day in and day out, going through a program of positive conditioning in your leadership program. That's, that's outstanding. Uh, I actually, uh, when I was listening to you, I was remembering that I did a take on leadership in, in uh, my book, Executive Powers. It's a little plug. And I actually talked about leadership is almost like when you're a captain of a boat and you're selling tickets to your passengers to come on board. And it's like, what's in it for them? What's the journey all about? Why should I come? And so if you can give people a big enough reason to do something and the, the reason is even bigger than themselves to where there's a calling, to where there's an outcome, to where there's some positive hope, where they're doing more than just getting on this ship. They're doing more than just participating in the journey. Then that's really a, a beautiful place and a sweet spot for leadership. Would you agree? Absolutely. And I think in the military, we have kind of an innate, you know, like service, right, and in, in what we do. So I think a lot of people join the military with some sort of calling. I know that's where my journey started. However, the grind beats you down, right? Like uh, uh, the hustle of the military, like we are in this like whack-a-mole game. We are just in this constant never-ending surge, right? I joined prior to 9-11. And so I kind of uh, remember what it was like before 9-11 hit. And then since then, we have been in this constant state of war and like, go, go, go. And especially as someone in the mobility community, like air mobility, we're all over the world all, all the time. Right. And so there's never an opportunity to like stop the mission. It's constantly going. And so, you know, it, it's, it gets you tired. And I know I found myself in a space where I was mentally, emotionally, physically exhausted all at the same time. And I needed solutions to keep staying on this high performing course that I, that I was on and that I wanted to stay on, right? I wanted to be a badass at everything I did. And so that's really where these skills, especially those related to mental skills training became vitally important um, to how I, I lived my life. And today, of course, you're doing that. You, you, how did you actually discover this mindfulness, if I may? Yeah, no, the, a great question. So when I was writing my dissertation, um, and I, I got sent back to school right at the perfect time in my career. I'd been go, go, go for 13 years. I had flown three different airplanes, done all those multiple deployments, multiple uh, TDYs, temporary duty around the world in different ways. And so I was exhausted. And so I remember sitting there thinking, I have this opportunity to study something. And what do I want? What question do I want answered? And really, I wanted to know, why is life so hard? And why can't I accelerate my professional success without having to sacrifice my health and relationships along the way? Because I looked at myself, I looked at everyone around me, and I'm like, we all want to be successful, but you know, there's we're wrought with like divorce and un, um, unhealthy uh, lifestyle behaviors. We're all exhausted. We're burnt out. Like, why can't we do this better? So my dissertation was really about how do you build the most effective human we weapon system to execute the military's high stress mission. And so everything I studied, I tried on myself. Right, I was going out there looking for what are the like, what do the people that push the boundaries on human potential, like the people that are the best in the world, the organizations that are the best, what skill sets are they using to thrive? And I found that we have a huge gap in the military with my research. And what I where and that's this is where mindfulness came came in. I found that we can train three things as human beings. We can train our body, our craft, and our mind. And we spend a lot of time in our craft, right? As a pilot, I spent years training to be a pilot. Um, we understand our bodies are important. We have physical conditioning programs. However, I had never formally trained my mind. And it was 
was so eye-opening to me when I was doing this research. I was like, wait a minute. I can train my mind so that I can handle the stress differently. I can optimize my performance. I can actually accelerate it. Why did like why has no one ever taught this to me? And why doesn't the military focus in this area? And so that's where I found, well, what is the best way to train your mind? And the foundational skill set is mindfulness. And so I started using it myself and it just really had a huge impact on my ability to manage the chaos, manage the uncertainty and still thrive and be a high performer. And, you know, when you give that to us, to our listeners out there who are, you know, taking this in and really enjoying hearing about your journey, how can you define to them uh, in a nutshell what mindfulness really is? I like to equate mindfulness to mental push-ups. I think it's, it's something that resonates with my understanding the idea behind physical push-ups, as most of us do. Um, I use the analogy of mental push-ups, and I use that because it's, you know, we all understand that I can't just do one physical push-up and then be physically strong. I have to do it repetitively to build that physical strength. So it's the same thing. I now use this idea of mindfulness being a way to train my mind to build mental strength, mental resiliency, mental flexibility, to face adversity and challenge and be able to adjust in the moment. And really what it is, is it's training my attention system to live where my feet are planted. You know, I spent most of my, you know, early adult life thinking about work when I was at home and home when I was at work. Have you ever done that? I think all of us do. And we're never anywhere. And we're whenever we're somewhere, we're always somewhere else. Exactly, exactly. And it was so, you know, I was wasting so much of my energy doing that. And so it was when I started practicing mindfulness, started strengthening my attention system to live more on what I would call like the play button of your mind, right? Instead of thinking and fast forward and rewind and this mental time travel that we do, just living more in the moment. And so really that's how um, I equate and teach mental uh, mindfulness is really as mental pushups to build that mental strength in your attention system. And do you start, for example, if you were to make some recommendations, because there's a lot of chaos out there right now. And there's a lot of people who are, you know, um, in all due respect, they're, they're losing it. You know, there's a, there's a lot of stress, financial stress, emotional stress, family stress, unsurety. Uh, it's the who moved my cheese moment in the world, and particularly now with uh, the climate that we have going on in this country. Is there anything you could maybe suggest? Is there some meditation or some place to start where they can really start to maybe use some, some self-healing tools? Yes, for sure. So the way I really like to kind of teach people about what mindfulness is and how to integrate it into their everyday life is, you know, start thinking about this idea. And I learned this as um, I worked with special operators before I left the Air Force. And they have a motto that slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Right. But we're in this culture and I call it like a competitive stress culture where it's almost like we measure our value in society based on how busy or stressed out we are. And it's about flipping the narrative around that and saying, actually, there is value in solitude. There is value in stopping and slowing down a little bit. And it takes a little bit of a, a messaging, internal messaging with yourself to, to get around that because our cultural norms are so strong in that way. Um, but that's the first thing you need to do, like really evaluate your life and figure out like where are your priorities and where can you create space for yourself to slow down a little bit. And then with that slowing down, that's really where you can tap into your breath to really learn how to practice those mental push-ups. And I just tell people to start with a minute, right? If I tell you to like start with like you got to sit on a cushion for 20 minutes a day, cross leg, you know, and, and people are going to freak out, right? That's hard. I, I freaked out when I first thought that's how medit that's what meditation. I did it. It was no problem at all. I just couldn't get up. <laughs> That happens to some people too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it can be very daunting or people think like, oh, I just, I, my mind can't stay quiet for that whole 20 minutes. So therefore I'm bad at it. I'm not going to do it. So I ask people to just like start with a minute, right? Like try to channel one minute of your day where you can just sit take some deep breaths, right? Really anchor on the sensations of your breathing, really focus on maybe one particular sensation. So I tell people to maybe choose the way the air goes in and out of your nostrils or the rise or fall of your belly or chest, but pick that one single sensation, focus intently on it, 
And then anytime your mind wanders in that minute, which it will, right? Most of us are highly distracted, so it will. As it wanders, and I like to think of your attention system like a flashlight, right? It can be focused at whatever's uh, in front of you, or it can be mm -hmm. focused internally, right? Thoughts, feelings, and emotions. So we want our flashlight externally. So we're focusing on our breath. As it starts to turn internally, as we think and get distracted, I want you to flip it back out, refocus on your breath. And every time you get distracted and you refocus, that is a mental push-up, right? You're strengthening that attention system and flashlight to stay in the moment. And so start with a minute, right? Start someplace easy and then gradually start to kind of build. And what I've actually found in my life is that if I sit for 20 minutes in the morning and practice mindfulness, I'm great, but I'm so high stress by about like two or three o'clock. I kind of like start, my anxiety starts amping up again. So I do a little bit in the morning and then I do more mindful minutes throughout my day to kind of cultivate mindful awareness for a longer period of time. And I also find um, many people find it, um, you know, getting out in nature. You don't have to just like, just going for a walk can be a way to practice mindfulness. Choosing one of your favorite activities, like I love skiing. I happen to to live in the mountains of Utah. So I do that a couple times a week during the winter. And sometimes it's just about getting on the mountain for just an hour, right? Doing a couple runs, like breathing in the fresh air, taking in the oxygen that like is my mindfulness and my mental exercise. So we all have activities we love and it's about tapping into those more and then creating that space in your life to just slow down a little bit. And the science behind it, so I'll, I'll geek out on you for the science. So the science of distraction is that we spend half of our waking moments not paying attention to what's going on in front of us. So if you think you're being productive, right? Like we've all read a page in a book and then you get to the bottom and you're like, I don't remember what I read. So that's mind wandering. It's an unintentional way for our brain to time travel. And it usually takes us to places we don't want to go. Unhappy places is, is unfortunately what, what usually happens. And so when you think about that at face, level, face value, half your day, you're not paying attention. So when you start integrating mindfulness in these mental push-ups, you can decrease the amount of time you spend mind wandering and get more time back, right? So I know I'm asking people to carve out these minutes to kind of practice their mindfulness. And they're like, I barely have enough bandwidth to do things I need to do. But the science will tell us when you practice and in institute these mental push-ups, you will actually create more productivity and efficiency within your day. You know, you may have saved uh a lot of marriages here because now husbands can turn to their wife and say, listen, honey, I, I know you've been talking to me, but my, I have this mind wandering thing going on. And that's why. That is absolutely what happens. And it happens all the time with my, my kids and me, you know, the mom, 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 and I don't even hear it. <laughs> and that brings me to another point here. You are. I mean, I think you're a badass. Uh, you use that word. And I have to agree, but all the things that you've done. And now today you're a mom you're a wife. Uh, you've now got this partnership. Tell us about this with the coach of the Seahawks. What's going on there? It sounds really exciting. Oh, this is just one of the joys of my post-military career. You know, one of my goals was to work, you know, ha have meaningful work with amazing people. And I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Michael Gervais, who's a high-performance sports psychologist, and he has a podcast called Finding Mastery. And so while I was in the thick of my military career and as a squadron commander introducing mindfulness, he interviewed me. And so we met that way. He also happens to work with Pete Carroll and the Seahawks. And so as I was transitioning out of the military, looking for kind of teammates and how we could fill what I would really call a cognitive training gap we have in military circles, right? We don't train our minds. And so I was looking to help find a way to fill that based on the work I had started while I was in uniform. And Mike and I and, and Pete got together and we've each kind of innovated in our own fields, right? Pete Carroll has been really innovative. He was the coach at USC and did some um, great things there before he took over for the Seahawks and really instituted, you know, these, I, this idea of like connection and being your best self and using mental skills to really get there. And then Mike has worked with extensively with elite um, Olympians and people who push the boundaries on human potential. And so the three of us got together and created a program we called um, Warrior's Edge. You and it's really, the three yeah. of you. Wow. 
<laughs> yeah, so it's it's a great program. It's it's built and designed. It's taught with a warrior athlete perspective, right? So both um, the needs of the warrior and uh, the, the needs of the athlete. And we are designed to help individuals who operate in high stress environments, which today you could really argue is all of us, um, not just military or law enforcement or healthcare. Like most of us uh, are in a high stress environment, just in everyday life, right? We're trying to work from home, school from home, manage households, deal with uncertainty and chaos, as you mentioned. So if I was a, uh contender for I wanted to go to the Olympics I wanted to win a gold medal um, I, you can see what my physical record has been and where my pushes push buttons were on the course or whatever whatever sport I was doing but would you interview me about my personal emotional state would you get into that tell us a little bit about that holistic treatment yeah so I would say you know, the, the physical capabilities as well as the training of your craft, like that is just the entry level, right? Like everybody that's trying to be a badass and, and do great things in, in their space, like trying to be an Olympian, like they are working hard physically and training for their craft. The difference, right? The difference is are you also working on your mental game? And so a lot of times that's the one if I ask people like, what is your formalized mental skills training program? And most people say, what do you mean? Like formal mental skills? Like that doesn't exist. I don't know what you're talking about. Maybe they do a little bit of meditation, but here's the thing, like our course, we teach 16 principles of mindset because it's not just about mindfulness. Mindfulness is our primary exercise because it's a way to strengthen, right? The, the muscle um, of our attention. But once you learn how to strengthen that muscle of attention and live more present, that kind of helps you disengage from negative thought patterns or have a different relationship with them, right? Instead of having that voice in your head telling you negative thoughts, you learn to live more present so you can kind of disconnect from that. Um, the, the second layer, though, is layering on top like the right thoughts to have, right? Because you can have all the skills in the world, but if you can't execute in the seventh game of the World Series, Right? It's, it's like you don't have the skills at all. If, you, if I can't fly my plane in a combat zone when I'm getting shot at in a thunderstorm and losing engines, right? Like it, it, that's when it matters. And it's mental skills that enable you to do those things in those environments. And that's just something that's a new field of study. It's a new way of looking at performance. Um, and I think that it's going to become a new cultural norm. I think it'll take us a little while to get there, but we'll understand the value in just emotional regulation, right? Like think about our world today and how much is going on with like um, discourse and disagreements. A lot of that just has to do with our lack of being able to communicate effectively, listen, and emotionally regulate um, through our decision-making. Two questions there. Why? Why do we as people uh, have these negative thoughts where they come into our mind and go, oh my God, you know, I'm on a plane, there's turbulence, we're going to crash, it's going to be a problem. We always see the, the or at least we normally do, uh, I do particularly when the plane is doing like that. Why do we do that? So some of it has to do with your psychological framework and some of that is how you were raised. You know, a lot of, um, there's definitely like, Different personalities and different people have different levels, right, of anxiety. But when you're, when you have kids and you spend a lot of your day telling your kid, hurry up, hurry up, go, 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 go. And, and you use language around them that's like, oh, I always hit every red light. Like this always happens. Like life always sucks. And you're using that type of language. They're going to really grow up with this framework that's more toward pessimism, right? Like, and that's really what our minds, a tendency is to aim toward negative thoughts because of our primitive brain, right? We have an ancient brain that lives in this modern chaotic world. And our ancient brain is really wired for survival. And so when stress is applied, we go into survival mode, right? And so we're looking for threats. We are looking for the negative. And when you build psychological skill sets and mental skills, right, and, and kind of cultivate that primitive brain and take it to a new level, you don't just go into survival mode. You can actually go into a thriving mode when you're faced with stress. But if you haven't done that, that's why the de default usually is those negative thought patterns. Is that and what's so, called a reptilian brain? 
It is. It's a reptilian brain and the, the little, the organ that we, we always the allude brain. to, the amygdala. Okay. Yep. And it's the amygdala. That's like your emotional center. That's where your stress response is really anchored. It's where it will kind of do that quick. Like, is this a threat? Is this a challenge? Do I have the resources to meet this demand of whatever it is? And then, you know, like think back to like caveman days. This is why I think mindfulness and anchoring on our breath is so important. Like when we had our stress response and we got a, we had a saber tooth tiger coming at us, we would run away, right? That's the fight or flight would tell us run away. So um, we'd, we'd run from the threat. And as soon as we were safe, we would go <sighs> and take an elongated exhale. And so what an elongated e exhale in our primitive brain triggers is our relaxation response. I'm safe. It tells our mind, right? Like you're safe. You right. can stay calm. So if we train right now, right? And in a quiet environment, you learn how to tap into your breath trigger that relaxation response when you're in a combat zone or you're on an aircraft and it bumps starts bumping a little bit and you start thinking all those negative thoughts or you're running late somewhere and the kids are upsetting you and you know like you can take like a single deep breath and then tell your you know go back to that primitive mind to say it's okay like you're you're okay you're safe you can stay calm and relax you know i'm fascinated i'm listening to this uh, dr janelle and the timing in the US right now, I'm just, I'm almost fantasizing that your program could roll out to law enforcement academies all across the country to just help this, I don't wanna say, maybe trigger happy or, or fight or flight response versus having that calming layer to be able to bring a heightened sense of awareness and then response instead of reaction. Absolutely. That's really what it's designed for. Mindfulness and tapping into our breath builds and cultivates that awareness so we can get control of our thoughts and choose better thoughts, right? Because those negative thoughts, even though I'm a big practitioner of this stuff and I teach it and I'm very well aware, I still get negative thoughts, right? And I still struggle sometimes with trying to find the positive and the optimistic framework that I need. But because it is so powerful, right? Especially in our society today. Um, and part of that is also because, here's the other thing, our high stress occupations like the military and law enforcement, they train us how to be effective in high stress situations, right? Because that's where we're gonna operate. And so that's a sympathetic, response and so they train us to actually be addicted a little bit to that sympathetic nervous system that that like oh i'm i'm in it kind of feeling and so what that is also causing is overreactions right when we don't need to be completely sympathetically activated if we're just dealing like with our kids right we're not in a combat zone we're not in these high stress high threat environments but we feel like it um additionally Sometimes when people go on a deployment, they'll be fine. They come back from their deployment or they separate from a uniformed occupation, whether that's law enforcement or military, and they don't know how to relax, right? Like they've only been taught how to be exercise their sympathetic yeah. system. They've never been taught they how to. And they feel empty. They feel lonely. They, they feel like they don't have a purpose. Exactly. And it's a very uncomfortable space for them, right? And so then they go seek out high-risk behaviors or they tend towards substance abuse or we have these depressive and suicidal thoughts that come into play um, because we, we've never trained or exercised our parasympathetic system to learn that it is okay to slow down. It is okay to slow down. Yeah. Very interesting to hear from you, Dr. Janelle McCauley. I'm certainly we're going to hear more about you and your new team that you put together on mindfulness and creating amazing uh, outcomes for people who want to be able to understand how to take their performance to the next level. A great talk. Thank you for being on the Real Mission on Possible show. And I'd love to have you back because I'd like to drill down into this. It's just a great, great topic. I would love that. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed my time with you. And yeah, I would love to come back and chat more. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Dr. Janelle McCauley, ladies and gentlemen.